we talk about the fact that they're carbon neutral, carbon negative. We can even make them more carbon negative, providing we put into, the tr into these organisms, such as switchgrass, the traits that will improve soil quality. As it is now, the crops we are using have been selected to respond to fertilizer. Basically, the soils are not used as an economic or an ecosystem service. They're a hydroponic system. Uh, and the traits that we need are changes in root architecture, symbiotic processes, and actually getting into uh, understanding when we put a field into, like switchgrass, into long-term uh, growth, perennial uh, agriculture in many ways, we don't know the consequences. Because why do we till the soil? Cut down on diseases, weeds, and so on. What happens when we put crops into perennial, uh, in up to a perennial system? We're going to see decline. We do not know right now the long-term consequences of those kinds of actions. One of the things that I've been involved with is a multi-laboratory university program called Seasight, where we've got economists, uh, hydrologists, soil scientists, microbiologists, uh, terrestrial ecologists, and we're trying to understand where do we need to manage if we're going to be sequestering carbon. And basically, part of it is increasing the residence time in certain pools. Because we realize that, that soil carbon sequestration isn't going to solve the problem. The problem is too big to solve. But it's going to help us, in the short term, better understand how we're managing our soils. But one of the things that we're interested in is what do you manage for? One of them is increasing the recalcitrant nature of the product. Uh, okay, now here's a problem. Human, the, the GTL program for DOE wants to create biofuels for their cellulosic biofuel program that has less lignin in it. What happens if you take lignin and decrease the lignin in a plant? They fall over. Uh, it, it, uh, you know, but it also makes them nice and yummy, and they turn over quite rapidly. Well, one of the questions that's a really interesting one that hasn't been answered, okay, uh, well, I need to back up just a second here, um, is the traits that one needs to put into a plant, and I'll talk to it in just a second. What I want to do here, though, is go on and talk about the loss of the prairie here rather quickly. 18, in 1830, there were 87,000 kilometers squared in Illinois alone of tall grass prairie. By 1860, there were only 10 kilometers, 10 square kilometers. Today, 1,000 hectares. If you look at the clearing of the land there, the clearing of the prairie is going at a faster pace, went at a faster pace than anywhere else on this earth. On the other hand, it also has allowed for the prosperity of this country. If you take, go to, and I tell teachers when they come to my land to explain the prosperity of this country, and one of the things that why Chicago is where it is, it, you know, nature's metropolis, its place is its situation in the richest soils in the world. And if you go to, if you go to a map and draw out the soils of the Corn Belt around the world, then you draw our climate. Basically, you get this big area in North America, and then you just get little slivers in the rest of the world. This is what we're dealing with here. There is something very unusual about what we're dealing with. So what I wanted to bring up quickly is this particular picture here. One of the things that happens is when 
we go into agriculture, one of the things is when the tall grass prairie was put into row crop, we got a big burp of CO2. Basically, much of the unaccounted for carbon may have come from the plowing of the grasslands of the world for agriculture. The other thing is, it takes, we don't know how long it will take to change the trajectory to the other direction. This is something I've been working on. So one of the things that we're interested in is understanding the arrow for decomposition, because one of the things we don't really understand are those traits that we need to put into the plants that will affect the residence time in organic matter, and also uh, for biofuels, too. What, another factor that needs to be considered if we're going to consider the price of organic matter in soils, it seems that since we don't really put a price on it because we don't use it to grow our crops, let's put it another way. The more organic matter you have in a soil, the greater its water holding capacity. And I think we're going to find out water is the limiting factor. And what we can show is by just increasing the organic matter content a little bit, that soil can hold enough water for that crop or that plant to survive, say, three, five, ten days longer during a drought. So when we start thinking about managing our soils, one of the things we need to do is realize when we talk about organic matter, we are talking about water. The other thing to consider is for every molecule of carbon dioxide that is fixed by a plant, it takes about a thousand molecules of water. So think about it, if when you put it on a weight basis, there is a lot of water that is needed to produce a plant. So one of the things is do not separate carbon from water. They go hand in hand. You cannot have a lot of biomass if you don't have water. And I guess my time is getting real short here. Uh, but the other thing, though, is much of our work has been on soil structure. How is it that you can take the tall grass prairie, and when I go out there, you can pick up a handful of soil, and it's the crumb structure. And I find I can go to China, I can go to India, South America, anywhere. When I talk to farmers, we talk about soil, and the thing we talk about is crumb structure. This is the soil tilt. This, you can tell, you know, matter of fact, good farmers will even taste their soil. Well, I, anyway. Uh, but one of the things that is interesting about it, think of it this way. One of the things, if we're going to be controlling the carbon cycle, think of what's it, if you take, if you have lysimeters in the soil in a recently tilled prairie versus a, an undisturbed prairie remnant, or e even restored prairies, what's interesting is you'll find in the prairie remnant actually very little nitrogen in the soil solution. Yet you measure the amount of nitrogen that is in that soil, it's huge. It's because most of the organic matter is protected. And in some ways, I, it's kind of like a pipeline theory where basically think of pores that get smaller and smaller within those aggregates to the, to the point where they get so small that microbes no longer have access to that organic matter. Basically, a microbe will break down every bit of organic matter <coughs> it can gain contact with. <coughs> so part of it is <coughs> understanding the mechanisms how organic matter accumulates. Excuse me here. <coughs> um, and what it is, is 
For example, if you have a, a sandy soil, the only way organic matter is going to accumulate is through droughty conditions because there are no protection mechanisms. You need clays, polyvalent cations, in order to start forming the complexes that allow soil structure to occur. By creating soil structure, you also decrease, uh, thank you. You also decrease erosion. You increase infiltration. If there's a rain event, Rather, it, one of the things with, with the rain events, take to a cornfield, a raindrop hits an aggregate, <coughs> it explodes. The water rushes in so quickly because of the air inside the aggregate, it explodes. You go to a prairie remnant or, or restored prairies, a raindrop hits it, they're hydrophobic. The water goes in very slowly, the soil stays intact. So part of it is understanding natural processes that will allow us to better manage soils. The other thing is the tall grass prairie is a good paradigm to understand biofuels. Why is it year after year after year we can get about seven, at least at Fermilab, we're, we're getting about seven tons per hectare carbon with no fertilization, year after year after year. They cut off, you know, in other words, it's reproduced every year. We can burn it, whatever. This is something to understand. How does nature allow this to happen? What is it about the prairie that can allow for such production that has been going on for the last 10,000 years. When we look at carbon stocks, you know, when we talk about caps and trades, things like that, one of the problems is how do you measure carbon? It ends up measuring carbon is very difficult because we can only measure it at the percent level. So to measure a change takes a very long time. The other is just a small change in bulk density can change your whole calculations. And we can't even, if we have a difficult time measuring carbon, try measuring bulk density. It's not an easy thing to do. So doing this correctly is a very difficult task. So we've been working at Fermi for, gosh, 20, 25 years now. And one of the things that's interesting is because of the chrono sequence that they have out there, that we're basically on the same kinds of soils, we can get a nice trajectory at the recovery rates that are going on. And uh, we are coming up with about 0.8 mega, megagrams carbon per hectare per year in the, first, in the 15 centimeters of the soil profile. What's interesting about this is that we can achieve 50% of a prairie remnant we calculate it'll take about 85 years. If we look at where we're at here, uh, we can see compared to the remnant, we have a ways to go. But I think the interesting thing here is if we take kind of a watershed view, and in this case, our wet mesic would be a drummer, uh, then we have a, a mundelein, uh, silt loam, and a Barrington, you know, where we can go a wet, and, and, well, first off, at Fermilab, you know, topography, if we have big topography, we're talking about a, a foot or so. You know, we're not talking about big difference. But if we look at the difference over there, we can get quite different carbon accum accumulation rates depending upon the topography and where they're located. Also, our drainage tiles in place, so on. I think one of the things we need to realize, the reason why our soils have so much carbon at least in the remnants, is because they're frozen for much of the year. The water table used to be basically the soil surface. With drainage, we're allowing for oxidation. Uh, <clears throat> we have erosion, other issues now. But this is one of the big things. So what we did was, let's take this information. Let's go to Fermilab, where we we're doing the work. Let's go in there and classify the soils accordingly 
And then we can come up with the areas and the amount of carbon that's accrued. Let's take that, and then let's go to the next step. Vehicle CO2 emissions, compact cars. Okay, we took this off of a website from somewhere. Uh, actually, it was Chuck Gartner at Oak Ridge that came up with the, uh, uh, with the idea. But if we had a compact versus a, an SUV, we came up with some numbers here. We determined if we restored the area at Fermi, all of it to tall grass prairie, an accumulation rate, and, and we assume that, that the drivers are dry, driven about 15,000 miles a year. What we came up with that's interesting is currently 400 acres offsets 222 personal vehicles per year. I think if we sat down and did this exercise, you know, uh, it, it, and, and part of it is this is a bit overly optimistic, but because actually the rates that we have probably are not as high as we think they are. But it's kind of an interesting exercise that if we would take all the land, for example, in Illinois or in the Midwest and convert it, what we, you know, but we can't convert the, uh, all of this, but it gives you an idea that there is value in putting carbon into the soil. It's a way of offsetting. There is something to it, but we don't actually know the consequences. We don't know how long it's going to stay in the resident, in these different pools and so on, but it raises a lot of interesting questions. So I guess my time's up and uh, the exciting stuff was going to come later, but we'll talk later. So thank you.